morning. I am grateful that we are gathered for worship today. A special word of welcome if you're worshiping here for the first time. Uh, a, a welcome to all of us. I invite you to make sure you write your name on the attendance pad. And if we don't have it, give us your contact information so we are able to reach out to you. If as you are here, you look around and you see some folk that you haven't seen for a while or people you don't know, uh, I encourage you especially to reach out to them and uh, make everyone feel welcome. I have a couple of announcements this morning. Um, doesn't this weather make you feel like Christmas is around the corner? <laughs> you don't know it, but Christmas is around the corner in the sense that next Sunday, we are going to look at the Christmas passages to take Christmas, the Christmas story, completely out of the context of the rush of Christmas season and to really think about the meaning of what that great day was about. So I, I will not encourage you to wear your Christmas best next week, but be in the, be in the Christmas spirit next week as we gather and as we think about uh, Christ's birth in a new way, in a new perspective. Um, the other thing I want to encourage you to do is this week we start the Journeys of Faith class. This is a class that I teach periodically in the life of the church. It is open for people who want to become members of the church, people who have been members of the church and want to get a refresher. This is really about uh, just some basics about how Christian faith looks at things, how the Presbyterian Church looks at things, and it is a way for us to connect with each other. And it's called Journeys of Faith because we share with each other where we have gone, how we have journeyed in our faith. Uh, so I'm starting to teach this class today. It'll go through September 15th. It's every Sunday at 11 o'clock. It'll take place in the crump room, which is the meeting room right above uh, the kitchen. So anyone and everyone is welcome to come and join us. And if you can't make all of the sessions, that's okay. Uh, we're able to, to go in and out of those sessions and still make you feel like you're a part of the entire thing. Um, and again, open for people who may want to become members of the church or those who have been members for a long time and want to reconnect. Other announcements that need to be made this morning. We begin worship with the waters of baptism and the reminder that in these waters we join Jesus, not just in the ministry of Jesus, but we join Jesus symbolically in his death and resurrection. These waters remind us that we belong to each other and we belong to God. So as we share that sense of connection to God, we share a sense of connection with each other. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. I invite you to stand and share signs of Christ's peace with one another.
Amen. <laughs> uh, good morning. Uh, please arise as you're able. Join me in the responsive uh, call to worship. Rejoice, beloved. Jesus came to earth to be closer to us. Jesus lived in solidarity with human beings. Jesus came so we could be closer to God. Jesus wanted us to feel God's love fully. Jesus came to be the example of faithfulness, grace, and justice. Jesus showed us the way to God. simply by asking if you'll join me this morning in our responsive prayer to confession. Jesus risked it all. He laid all his privilege aside. He came to humanity to be in solidarity with us. What a story of sacrifice and love. Holy One, Jesus was truly one of us. We confess the mercy of God. There are Help us dig deep enough so we will be in solidarity with Jesus 
who is already in solidarity with those who suffer injustice. In his name we pray. Amen. Jesus came to help people like you and me. Jesus became a servant to us in every way. So he could show the mercy of God and allow us to reconnect with God by becoming the healing of the world himself. children of the church to come forward. We're taking bets as to what that is. <laughs> I'm sure it's the air conditioning somehow. I have no idea. Good morning. Who here can stand on just one foot. Prove it. Come over here. Over, over here. Can you stand on one foot only? Let me see. I can do it. You guys do it? You can fall. You have to be careful. And without holding on to anything. You guys should. Can you try? I, I. Can you do it on the other foot? You can even hop on? You know, some, what if I said, I'm going to help you stand up one foot? All right, go ahead and stand one foot. I'm going to help you. Watch, I'm helping you. Does that look like I'm helping you? It doesn't, does it? What if, oh, come over here. You want to come? So if we hold hands, if you want to join us, it's fine. But if you're not, it's all right. Either way, it's cool. All right, and what if we stand on one foot now? Oh, that's a lot easier says he. Look at that. And, well, we could even hop, I suppose. Can you hop? I can't even hold hand and distract me. The distraction? I think, maybe not the hopping. Oh, you can do it without. I think, I think we can help each other better. Let me try the other foot. I think we can help each other better if we hold on to each other. You don't think so? <laughs> You realize that's like the whole point of my, my children's sermon? <laughs> okay. Okay. Here's what I, here's how I hear what you're saying. That you get distracted with other people doing stuff. One of the things I was thinking about is if I'm trying to help somebody, I have to somehow be supportive of them and be more, be closer rather than just sort of like, do, 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 I'm helping you. And I was thinking about that because I think that Jesus, when Jesus is trying to help us, isn't just like Jesus is way over here and is, is saying something to us. 
that Jesus is with us in our heart, I think that makes a difference. I think it makes a difference when we're trying to help people if we are staying connected to them. So what I want to invite you to do today, or want to invite you to do this week, is, you know how we talk about helping people? We talk about that a lot, don't we? I want you to think about what does it look like helping somebody, but really being with them, being really close and being supportive, okay? So maybe that means helping them with some chores, maybe that means helping uh, somebody in your family, maybe that means helping somebody that's your neighbor, but really being there. So I want you to think about that, and maybe next week you can tell your friends as well. I, next week, yes, could be your sister. And next week, I want you to tell me what you discovered. Will you think about that? Okay, let's pray together. God, thank you for the ways in which you help us and the way in which you teach us to help each other. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. All right. I encourage you to stay with your parents and the little, little ones have time in nursery. Thank you. The scripture lesson for today comes from the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is one in the New Testament, way late in the New Testament, and is trying to sort of make a nice big loop around all the meaning that Jesus brings into our lives. And so we're reading today from chapter 2, verses 10 to 18. <clears throat> Listen to the word of God. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one heavenly parent. For this reason, Jesus, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in you. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, Jesus likewise shared the same things. So that through death, Jesus might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. And free those, free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that Jesus did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, Jesus had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect so that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because Jesus himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I was born in Mexico, and in Mexico, if you want to cut through bureaucracy, it helps to have somebody on the inside. I lived there until I was almost 15 years old, and my family is a basic middle-class family. My dad had a modest job. He was a teacher all his life, but he, you know, he had to supplement the family's income, so he had a second and third job and sold insurance forever. All but one of my siblings went to college, and all have very successful uh, lives. In fact, two of my siblings have especially done very well for themselves and for their families. But all in all, we were just a middle-class family with no specific influence or special standing in a complex and large community. Mexico, Monterey, Mexico at the time was over a million people. 
And yet, as a kid, I learned a lesson about influence that was accessible even to us. It's a very Mexican uh, term for this influence. Palanca. It's, it's the word lever. It's that plank of wood that you use to, you place it on top of a point of balance, the fulcrum, and you use it to lift a load. Think of like a seesaw in a playground, right? That idea of the lever is, is applies to when you're trying to get something done that requires extra help especially like cutting through the red tape and the bureaucratic system. Let's say you needed to get some paperwork done. Let's say you wanted to get your passport. And I mean, the lines are long for that stuff. And, and there's a lot of things that, that you need to do. But if you happen to know someone in the office, that helps. You start that conversation with your, maybe your friend or your acquaintance, and you find out that there might be a little shortcut to the process. There might be a, a shorter line over there, or there might be a special way in which your process can get done faster. It is that idea that the lever, it is that idea that that person is going to help you do the heavy lift, help you do the paperwork. The trick, of course, is that you are getting real insider knowledge and influence through that person. Knowledge that may not be widely known. It might even feel like favoritism. In other systems, like in the United States, I think we think of that as skipping ahead in line and somehow we have, oh, that's not right. But and yet, we have another way of doing that. You pay extra money, right? If you want your passport expedited, hey, you just fork out more money and it'll be faster. So it is, it is something that is accessible, but maybe accessible only for those who have that extra cash and that extra hurry. Now, I'm not suggesting, although this happens, but I'm not suggesting that this is a conversation about bribes. They do happen in Mexico. This is a conversation about knowing someone who can get you to the place faster, or knowing someone who, because of where they are in the inside of the system, can help you get to where you know. We have a phrase. We talk about it. We say, oh, I know a guy. That book of Hebrews that I was reading from is all about that. Oh, I know a guy. I know that sounds so pedestrian in the language and the passage sounds so high and theological, but that's what it's about. We know a guy. It's trying to explain how Jesus has a role of influence with God and on our behalf helps us as humanity, helps us get closer to God in a way that hadn't been possible before. Jesus is our inside guy who's making something happen for us. And see, Jesus is such a complex and enigmatic figure, and yet, at the same time, he is this approachable and helpful person in a process to connect to God. We talk a lot about Jesus and the life of the church, of course. And maybe we take for granted how we understand what Jesus is and the role that Jesus has. The author of the book of Hebrews trying to explain who Jesus is, trying to make sense of who Jesus is using the context of the original audience. Revisiting who Jesus is would be a good exercise for anybody, especially for us as believers. Maybe looking at it from a different perspective of someone who's maybe like listening to it like we've, we were just hearing it for the first time. In fact, like I mentioned earlier, we're going to be celebrating Christmas next week. And outside of the context of December and, 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 and the shopping and all that, it, it is going to help us have a different perspective. Listen maybe with new ears. So the big picture, Hebrew is telling us that Jesus had to become one of us in order to help us. As I mentioned, that's the explanation that uses the reality that they knew about. For them, forgiveness of sins was a process of sacrifice, literally. I mean, there was, there was literally the conversation about bringing an animal to an altar and having a priest or a high priest offer the sacrifice in order to secure forgiveness. That sounds 
so outside of our experience and our culture. But I share it because that's the way they were making sense of who Jesus was. And so here's where the passage wants to go, right? God, if, what if God sent Jesus, God's son, not only to, go, to be the go-between between God and human beings, like a priest, but what if that person was also the sacrifice himself? In other words, Jesus would be the answer, the all-inclusive answer, the once and for all answer to get humanity and God back together. Now, maybe you're already a step ahead of me on this. That sounds like a pretty angry God. Kind of a vengeful God who demands death and blood in order to grant forgiveness. Not only does that not sound like the God we think about and the God we love, but it doesn't sound much like the Jesus we think about. But remember, we're trying to understand Jesus from within the framework of how the people experienced Faith, life of faith at the time. And so rather than get caught up in all the gory details of that, I think the passage actually gives us the language to interpret the whole thing in a way that might be, may, may make more sense for us. Here's God, this indescribable divine being who wants to get closer to human beings. Here is God, this creator of all things, Grieving that the relationship between God and humanity has suffered because humanity has chosen to distance itself from God. You can call that sin. You can call that arrogance. You can think about it as an individual act. Or you can think about it as a corporate act. So God, this mysterious holy presence, decides to bridge the gap by becoming one of us. That's the ultimate example an expression of solidarity. If we could take, if we could create a physical expression of God's love, that would be Jesus. And again, we'll talk more about that next Sunday as we think about Christmas, but think about it in this way. If we think about the work of Jesus, if we think about his teachings, and we think about this revolutionary connection with people living in the margins of society. Think of it as solidarity with human beings. We get to see Jesus as a real sibling of ours and as someone as close to us as our own flesh and blood. Now, the Hebrews passage makes much about Jesus' as suffering in the context of solidarity with humanity. I also read that fearless, I read it as a fearless commitment to us as people, undaunted even by getting hurt in the process to show us how serious God is and how serious Jesus is to be close to us. In other words, Jesus didn't phone it in. He lived out his commitment to support us and to bring us closer to God and closer to each other. So that idea of solidarity with us is an expression of love. It's not something that ends with him. It's something actually that we can be a part of. It's a lesson that Jesus is presenting in his teaching. You know, we as a congregation talk about and work towards social justice a lot. And we talk about supporting people who find themselves overlooked and marginalized. Well, that belief doesn't come from nowhere. That's not just some idealistic goal. That's not just a modern cultural trend. I'm saying that's what Jesus was doing. Solidarity with people in the margins is what Jesus was doing. So when we talk these days about being supportive of people in need, we think about the words like, words like advocate or we think about words like ally. The way Jesus was our ally informs how we are expected to be allies with those who suffer. Solidarity meant that Jesus knew who was on the outside looking in. And so he went there. His expression of solidarity was with people that were hurt by, by the system, whether they were sick or they were poor or they were the ones that were declared as less worthy. He didn't blame them for their condition or, uh, or the place where society had put them. In fact, just by being with them, just by being with them, 
he was already critiquing the system. Just by having dinner with them, people were like, why are you having dinner with sinners? To make a point about a system that placed people with that label in that place. And so Jesus was teaching us by example to look for who is crushed by the system that benefits some and not others. Jesus was teaching us by example to understand their reality with compassion and to raise a racket because of the injustice that they are being subjected to. And solidarity meant that Jesus was truly present with the people. Jesus wasn't commuting back and forth from heaven daily. Jesus taught us by example to be in solidarity and that means we change our address. It might mean our physical address, but it definitely means our heart's address. To be courageous, by, Jesus teaches us by example, to be courageous by making our solidarity something that is and feels permanent. And then solidarity meant Jesus used what he had at his disposal, not to benefit himself, benefit himself but to benefit others. Again, Jesus taught us by example to use our privilege to benefit others. Because people will hear us and will see us. And that will help others see the people we have come to be with and a part of. People who are in the margins. Be they people who are homeless. Be they children who get shuffled in the system while parents suffer with addiction be the immigrants who are told to go back to the country where they came from. To say that Jesus offers us salvation is right. What I think this passage helps us consider is the dimension of his work where we are able to participate in the work of solidarity with fellow human beings. Jesus showed us the way. Thanks be to God for God's word for us. Amen.
I'd like to invite John and Amy McCormick to come forward at this time. A few weeks ago, come this way, please. Uh, John and Amy uh, came before the session and reaffirmed their faith, the faith into which they were baptized. And in so doing, the session received them as members of the congregation, as new members of the congregation. And we're delighted that you are part of this worshiping community and a part of this uh, church in particular. And so I'm going to invite them to uh, introduce themselves, and then I will ask them one of the questions that is part of uh, our tradition in joining a congregation. So, Amy. I'm Amy McCormick. <laughs> what else am I supposed to do? <laughs> I'm John McCormick. <laughs> um, I'm grateful you're here. Uh, what has drawn you to the life of the church? <laughs> we spent a few years searching and trying to find a place where we felt comfortable. And this is the place that we found most comfortable. So that's why we're here. And the most welcoming, I have to say. I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful that you bring your gifts to the life of the church, your talents and your insights. So I'm grateful for that. Um, so <clears throat> as we have, as I mentioned, uh, you have shared your faith, uh, uh, your statement of faith or the, the, your affirmation of faith as we do. Uh, but I ask you this question also in the context of that tradition of joining. Amy and John, you have professed the faith of the one body of Christ. Will you be a faithful member of First Presbyterian Church of Columbus? Share in its worship and mission through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. If so, respond by saying, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Let us pray together. Eternal God, I'm grateful for John and Amy and for the ways in which you have brought them to this congregation uh, to continue in their journey of faith. I'm grateful, loving God, for the way in which they will teach us and we will learn together and the ways in which we will together be faithful in following you. So bless them and bless us in this process, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I hope you'll have an opportunity to greet John and Amy personally as we gather for the coffee hour after worship. Uh, we meet in the gym, which is immediately to my right. Uh, you can access it easily through the uh, passage through the back of the doors over there. So again, welcome. I'm grateful for you. This is the time in worship when we offer ourselves uh, joyfully to God. We're doing this uh, by side, so the pulpit side will join me. All we All have, have comes, comes from God. God. Together, let's serve God and love one another. Amen.
As we pray for one another and with one another, we share joys and concerns together. Uh, Julie Diker is um, praying for speedy recovery after a surgical procedure on Friday. So Julie, hope that that continues to go well. Um, today we are thinking about uh, Logan Putney. He ships off to boot camp uh, with the Marine Corps tomorrow. And we pray that he has a safe experience uh, and that uh, things go well. Uh, we have several of those for him. Um, um, we will miss him greatly. Uh, I know a guy will be with him. <laughs> Departs and, and we're grateful for him and are proud. We're proud of Logan. And we pray for Clay and Janet as well and for Lydia as they see him off. Uh, Julie Orban is asking for a family friend, uh, prayers for that friend going through trouble and um, with a child in rehab. We pray for that family. Um, Tracy is asking us, Tracy Heaton, my wife, is asking us to remember the, the family of David Gully on the passing of his father. David Gully is a friend of ours. Um, and grateful for him and we pray for his family in this time of grief. We also pray for continuing uh, um, healing. A friend of ours, John Haynes, is undergoing uh, cancer treatment in Philadelphia and so we pray for that to continue uh, to do the, kind, the, the helpful things that we are hoping it will create. Uh, we have celebration. Uh, it's good to see the Cressman family worshiping with us today. Carl, Sharon, Daniel, and Mitchell were members years ago uh, before they moved to Detroit and uh, they connect, they remain connected to, um, to FPC and grateful that you're with us today. I ask you to continue to pray for Dallas Anderson. This is Clint Anderson's dad. He has been uh, recovering from a stroke. He was in ICU for several weeks. He continues in the hospital. We pray for him, and also we pray for Sherry, his wife, uh, Sherry Anderson. As you know, that is difficult to, uh, to be the caregiver. Uh, it's, there's a, a great deal of stress that comes with that, and so we pray that she's getting the rest and support that she needs. Uh, of course, uh, Amy and Clint are right there for them. I offer a prayer of gratitude for the Sweet Dreams ministry that this church created uh, some time back. Uh, that offers beds to families that uh, need them, uh, specifically for families this, these days, for families who in the foster care system suddenly find themselves caring for grandchildren uh, unexpectedly. And so you may have seen on Facebook that, uh, that they have shared beds and in fact recently a yeah, sort of bunk beds. But those beds and even cribs are ways in which those families in this transition and difficulty are able to help for one help and support one another and gives dignity to the children to have their own beds. We pray for Leah Jackman Widener's friend who recently had a good result from a biopsy. We pray for our neighbor Paulette who was a resident here at the armory but uh, is not there anymore. She has gone in a nursing home and in fact she was recently in the hospital so we pray for Paulette. We pray for another neighbor of the congregation, uh, Leland Merrick. Uh, he's a good friend of ours, and he has serious health issues and also some family difficulties. So we pray for Leland. Uh, we pray for Liz Dom's sister, Becca, and her family. Um, military life can be stressful and sometimes even feel uh, unsettling and dehumanizing as people move about. So we pray for Becca and her family. Uh, Karen and Neil uh, ask us to pray for their granddaughter Kendra uh, and their grandson Scott. Kendra will be induced on Tuesday and will have a baby boy and we pray that all goes well in that process. And lastly, just a word of gratitude to Ray and Cindy for leading us in worship this morning. Will you pray with me? <coughs> God, we are thankful that you have a connection to us, maybe in a way that we cannot explain fully, but in a way that makes us feel fully connected to you. We are grateful for the way in which you care for us and your spirit is present in our lives. 
in times of difficulty, of illness, of recovery, of transition. God, we know that you use us in our actions, our prayers, our cards, our casseroles, our visits as part of your Spirit's work. Your Spirit's work that help us, helps us be in solidarity with one another, with solidarity with people we know, but then you make us be in solidarity with people we don't even know, people near and far who are in need of your support and care. And you allow us to be part of their journey. You even allow us to uh, be able to advocate with them and for them. God, we give you thanks that we are able to be challenged in that process. That we might live out the way in which Jesus lived out his love for us. And so we pray, you see the words that he taught his disciples. As together we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Jesus coming to us to support and encourage us, not being afraid even of suffering, in order to be by our side. May we go from this place fully convinced that our presence with people is part of Christ's love and part of Christ's work of being with each other in solidarity. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion in the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you now and always. And God's people say, Amen. Amen.
Thank you.